preparing the presentation. Uh, uh, Jerry Paulette uh, is an um, uh, informatic uh, engineer uh, based in uh, Bruges, in uh, Belgian town Bruges, which is a famous town related to water. So it's another reason to be <laughs> here. And uh, another very good reason is uh, his presentation uh, topic title, The Memory of Water, which brings us directly back to what uh, Jacques Benveniste uh, has uh, achieved. And we are uh, very much interested uh, what you are going to add to these, uh, to these insights. Thank you. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> So while they're installing the presentation, maybe very briefly, my name is Jerry Pollett. Uh, it sounds a bit confusing. I'm not Jerry Pollack. I'm also not a professor. Uh, yesterday, people started uh, to addressing me by uh, Professor Pollett. Uh, actually, I liked it. Um, I'm here with my brother and my dad. They're both physicians and uh, specialized in homeopathy. More about that uh, in a moment. And if you see my younger brother, who looks older than I am, then you can say to him, ah, you must be the older brother of Professor Paulet. He will really love it, I think so. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it's not yet there, but I will start telling you the story. Um, about 10 years ago, I had a research project going on with the Russian-born Finnish professor uh, called Alex Kaivaraiden. Uh, at the time we met for the first time, he was lecturing at the University of uh, Turku. Uh, we did some very exciting research uh, related to the memory of water. But unfortunately, by the time we were preparing the research to be published, uh, Alex passed uh, unexpectedly away, uh, far too young. Um, and since that time, this research has been gathering dust until the beginning of this year when uh, some physicians uh, came to me and they asked me, oh, would you like to give a presentation about what you did 10 years ago? Because uh, we would be uh, interested in, in hearing more about it. And I said, yeah, why not? So when I was preparing the presentation, I split it into uh, three parts. One part was more a general overview about uh, what is water, uh, what is special about water. I'm not going to give this uh, part here because I assume most of you know a lot more about water uh, than I do. The second part is then really about the uh, research Alex and uh, I did regarding to yeah, the memory of water based upon a theory, a hip hypothesis that he had in mind and that we were actually capable of, of proving. And then the last part is, while I was doing all the research, yeah, okay, sorry about the problems. <laughs> Thank you. So this was Alex. Love and gratitude to the best teacher I ever had, but unfortunately, who left us, left us much too, too early. So three topics, what, what we already know, I will not address that part. I call it smoke, the research we did in 2000, and it started in 2006, ended in 2008, and then fire, uh, it's about really connecting the dots uh, based upon what happened since the time I did the research uh, 10 years ago. Short introduction, as I said, my dad is here, and I think the story started uh, because of my dad, because at a certain moment, uh, 50 years ago, he decided that he did not want to be a prescription uh, robot of big pharma and he decided to specialize himself in homeopathy and as we all know with homeopathy zero plus zero yeah that's uh, sometimes not zero um, on the other hand um, I have a background in computer sciences and if you do zero plus zero and you have for instance a number like uh, 4987 uh, then you have a computer bug because hey, that cannot be possible and I made myself the promise when I was around 20 years old that before I would be 40, I would try to figure out what was going on there. Finally, I have also a son. He's called also uh, Jerry. Hey, we make it very confusing today. Four Jerry's. Uh, he's now a student biotechnology, but for him, 
I should lower his uh, pocket money because he still thinks that zero plus zero is, uh, is zero. <laughs> um, so I'm not going into this, this part because that's more for a general public, uh, but I'm going to briefly talk about that one. Uh, it's about the capacity of water to, to have maybe memory. If you take one drop of water, which is, has a weight of 0.05 grams, and you would replace all the water molecules inside that drop of water by one byte, you would have enough storage to store all the internet traffic that we would all generate this year over the internet. Yeah? So think about all the uh, Netflix movies we download, the posts we do on Facebook, uh, the Skype calls we do. You could store all that information in one drop of water, which is really amazing and is also one of the reasons, because it's so small, that it's extremely difficult to prove that water has memory. So the smoke parts, and um, 2006, uh, the company I co-founded co went uh, public and was listed on the uh, London Stock Exchange, and I had some uh, pocket money left, and I had a choice. Should I buy a nice apartment in Monaco and drive a Ferrari? Or should I do something like uh, try to figure out what I promised myself 20 years ago and I decided to do the last thing? And it would, if you would ask me today, are you going, would you still do the same? The answer is yes, I would still do the same. Um, the reason I came in contact with Alex, I was investigated about the memory of water. And I think when we talk about the memory of water, we, we always talk also about dilution and shaking. And for me, it was important to understand why is this shaking and this dilution so important? Eh, because we have heard this morning Professor Voikov about uh, Hahnemann, who discovered eh, the process of dilution. What maybe a lot of you will not know is how he came to the process of uh, shaking. Uh, initially, Hahnemann only started by diluting, diluting uh, his medicines. And then he gave, he gave the medicine people visiting his office and bringing the medicine to people at their homes. And what he discovered after a while is that the medicines he brought to the people at home were far more effective than the medicines he gave to the people at his office. And he didn't understand why, until he figured out how he went to the people at their home. It was by horse. So and this is really true. If you look at the biographies of uh, Hahnemann, that's how he figured out uh, why you had to check the, uh, the, the, the medicine. So I was looking on the internet and I came across a book called Hierarchi Hierarchical Theory of Solids and Fluids by a professor called uh, Alex Kaivarainen. And when I was going through the book, I couldn't understand anything about it because it was full of formula. But there was a sentence somewhere in the book that said, and if we want to understand homeopathy, we have to take into account also the process of dilution and shaking. And this is probably the mechanism of how it uh, should or could work. So I went to Alex and I said, you know what? Are you interested in starting together with me some research? And um, come to Bruges, we hire two uh, lab people and we're going to start doing the experiments that could prove that what your hypothesis is, is correct. Alex, as I said, professor in, uh, from the USSR. And with Alex, I started the research lab. And the thing Alex said is it's based upon Louis de Bruy. Louis de Bruy, for those who don't know him, it's a very famous quantum physicist. And actually, he was a student in Paris. And when he made his uh, end thesis, his uh, professors couldn't understand what he was writing about. So they sent his thesis to um, Albert Einstein, who said something like, wow, this is the missing part of uh, my theory. And because of that, uh, he got uh, his uh, Nobel Prize. So what is his theory is that any moving particle has an associated wave. We have all heard about wave-particle du uh, duality. Uh, Louis de Bruy put that in a formula, which says the wavelength is the Planck constant divided by momentum. Very simple, but what Alex teaches me uh, many times over is that when a particle uh, collapses into a wave, the wave you should see, he said, as a kind of a virtual replica, as a kind of an information cube. Because all the information to become a particle again is stored in the wave. 
So when I said to him, okay, in nature, three type of waves, I'm not going to address that. Maybe an interesting one to give you an, ex an example of how big such a wave is. If you would take a tennis ball which had, with a diameter of 6.5 centimeters, and I would walk with the tennis ball here, then suddenly when it would collapse into a wave, which cannot happen because it's too big, but just as a comparison, uh, the wave itself would have a diameter of uh, 100 meters. And the wave, again, you should see as a mathematical formula describing the physical particle of the tennis ball. So it's huge. So Alex's thought experiment was the following. He said, um, maybe this imprinting effect of uh, guest particles on water could be a quantum uh, phenomena at a macroscopic scale. And maybe, he said, this uh, imprinting effect could be a consequence of standing the broil waves of guest particles, eh, the 3D information cubes created by shaking. Because again, you have to shake. By shaking, you create the, the, the wave. So what he also reasoned was the following. The less mass a guest particle has at the same velocity of shaking, the bigger the information cube is. The larger is this volume then the larger is the number of molecules involved in the volume, and the, lar the larger should be the imprinting effect. Yeah? The imprinting effect, he said, should not be dependent on the charge of a guest molecule, but on its mass and ability to create standing waves. And it can be anticipated that at higher dilutions of guest molecules, the quantum effect should increase because of the decrease of the disordering contribution of the Brownian motion. These are all things uh, we have heard already uh, today and the day before, uh, but it's important to understand, okay, but how can this work? So what we did is we focused initially on two kinds of salts, uh, lithium and kalium. Lithium has a, a mass which is approximately three times smaller than kalium. So if there is an imprinting effect, because the mass is smaller the wave is bigger than the imprinting effect of lithium on the water uh, should be uh, bigger. The experiment uh, set up, we measured uh, several um, physical parameters of water, being density, sound velocity, and refraction index. And uh, of course, we did multi-stage dilution and shaking. Shaking, we both used rotational and uh, uh, translational uh, shaking to see if there was a difference. And the goal of these experiments was to find out if the differences exist and are reproducible. Mainstream science would say no, no difference can exist, especially not when the dilutions are very high. Um, I think I already explained that one. That was the research lab we had in, 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 in Bruges. A small picture was not very big. Um, and then the experiments we did on the left, and unfortunately, I don't have the uh, actual research anymore in digital format, so I had to copy uh, yeah, slides and then paste them in this document. So if they are not really good readable on the screen, I apologize, but afterwards you can download the presentation and there you can find the results uh, more into detail. But I think the most interesting slide is probably this one, where you have the saturation curve for lithium and then kalium. Again, lithium, three times smaller mass than kalium, so a much uh, bigger uh, imprinting effect according to the hypothesis of Alex. And what you can see there, you have a blue line and a yellow line that the more you dilute, the bigger the difference becomes. The same happens also with kalium, but there it stays much uh, smaller. So there is also a difference, but not as big because the wave is smaller. Then we also tried with shaking, but again, I'm not going into the details here because it's not readable. Um, but what we saw is that when you sh start shaking the water, that the differences become even much uh, uh, bigger. What's interesting to know, that's the following slide, is that uh, then we try to investigate, yeah, how many times do you have to shake? Is it something, if you keep on shaking, is it something that keeps on going on? Uh, the answer is no. We saw that around 200 shakes, that uh, it was leveling off. So it has no further influence on the, uh, the change in water properties. And um, similar, uh, if we did rotational uh, shaking, so with creating a vortex, it was a, a similar uh, effect. So after a couple of 
It was not even minutes, but you could stop it because it had no further uh, effects. Um, what we then did also was uh, after the uh, salts, we tried to do it with uh, vitamins and we took uh, B3 and we had exactly the same results. So what Alex says is that, and Professor Voikov eh, explained this morning, that in biology you probably have a physical key and you also have probably a remote key. And that's exactly the same what Alex said, is that uh, this in place implies that any regular drug could have two mechanisms of action on biolog biological systems, the convi conventional mechanism, as has been explained before, and then the new role via water. A last experiment was, uh, and we did far more experiments than the ones uh, I wanted to talk to you about today, was the evidence of water memory uh, boiling between boiling and cooling. What we discovered is that water remembers if it has been boiled, and that after approximately 24 hours, all the parameters again came in uh, equilibrium. So it has a memory also there. So his conclusion, um, and I go immediately to point two, is that the smaller the mass of the guest atom is, the bigger is the imprinting effect, which is dependent on the de Broglie uh, wavelengths, the Breuil wavelengths. Uh, I think uh, this has been proven more or less. Uh, the imprinting effect increases with the number of shakes of the solutions and the number of dilutions. Again, homeopathy. The printing is more dependent on the mass of ions than on ion exchange, and the discovery that the imprinting effects of dilution and shaking exist also for regular drugs like vitamin B, B3. Yeah. On a personal note, um, we did these experiments with sensitive equipment in 2008. The equipment had a, had a total cost of around 250K. We repeated these experiments dozens of times, each time yielding the same results. Today, if we would have to repeat these experiments, probably we could make them even better because uh, the equipment has come down in price the last time I checked while the sensitivity has gone up again. Um, what we try to claim with these experiments is that there is something strange going on in water which requires, requires further research, but I don't have to explain that uh, to you. And we call that our smoke, and where there is our smoke, there is maybe some fire. Um, here I'm going to talk to you about, uh, as I told you, I have a background in computer sciences. There is a lot going on these days about quantum computing. And I'm going to give you a very brief lesson about uh, quantum computing. Um, and when you look at quantum computers, uh, you have heard that they work with qubits. Now, in order to realize qubits, there are two things uh, important to understand. The particles of the elements that they are using to make qubits, they have to be in superposition and there has to be quantum entanglements. And if you don't understand what that is, don't worry, I don't think a lot of people understand it actually, how it really works. Superposition means if you put, um, if you take a singer and you let him sing do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, is that he can sing all the notes at the same time. That's superposition. Well, this quantum entanglement, if you take a whole bunch of singers, let's say 100, and you let them s sing all at the same time, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, and then you take one away, let's say Madonna, and you put her at the other side of the universe, and then you say to the 99 remaining ones, and now you have to sing me, at the same time Madonna will also sing me. So that superposition and quantum entanglement, what is the real challenge with building a quantum computer, is that in order to keep this quantum co coherence, you have to keep the computers very cold. That's why when you see pictures of quantum computers, they are always shielded electromagnetically, and also very cold. Eh? A few uh, degrees above uh, above zero uh, degrees uh, Kelvin. Um, currently, IBM, to give you an idea, has the world record for uh, the quantum computer with uh, 50 qubits. Once we are going in the direction of two, 300 qubits, then it becomes really interesting for us because then we are really be are going to be able to do interesting things on it. There is also an other approach in, um, when it comes to quantum computing, and it's actually an approach that's gaining uh, importance. And it's the fact that they say, OK, what f uh, shielding these computers that's going to, to be uh, too expensive? We are going to work with the system with a lot of cubics, uh, qubits, and hopefully, by using enough of them, uh, enough of them uh, here and there, there will be enough that will be uh, in coherence, and then maybe we can cal do calculations on it. Yeah. 
An example of a quantum computer, the traveling salesman problem. If you have to, to calculate such thing with a standard computer, it will take you a lot of time. And this triggered, this triggered my, uh, my, uh, yeah, my mind because what has this all to do with water? This is uh, something that has been investigated by the MIT where they saw that when an electron arrives on a leaf and it has to go to the reaction center hey, to convert sunlight into electricity, that it always chooses the shortest path. So this is, the, the leaf is solving the traveling salesman problem in a fraction of a time. And the only thing that can do that today, that's, all, that's being recognized by everybody, is the moment you bring uh, quantum communication, uh, quantum computing into account. Yeah? Exclusion zone water, uh, I spoke with Professor Pollack at uh, the London conference in July, and I said, I think there is more going on than just uh, being uh, storage, potential storage for memory. It looks like, for me, it looks like a quantum coherent domain, so maybe it's doing also some quantum computing. What they also discovered recently is that in carbon nanotubes, there is also water. Water starts freezing, they say. They don't understand what the water is doing, but it's in fact exclusion zone water. A step from uh, carbon nanotubes to microtubuli. We have already heard many times the past days about the microtubuli. Um, very small, full of water, uh, millions of, of uh, water molecules, also freezing water, what they call freezing water. So remember, make systems with hundreds of thousands of qubits to have enough workspace to correct errors due to imperfect logic operations. And I think that's what's happening. The hypothesis, we show that memory of water could be a quantum phenomena. Quantum computer requires superposition and entanglement. Re recent research indicates that nature uses quantum computing at room temperature. It could be that water molecules in structured water fulfill the quantum computer requirements. It has been discovered in carbon nanotubes and microtubuli. Microtubuli are found in almost all living cells, including bacteria. It could be that the water inside the microtubuli are the quantum computers of every living cell. And if this is the case, and I'm absolutely convinced that the coming years we will have confirmation, then every cell has more computing power than all the computers on Earth uh, together. So where is the smoking gun? This is cell division. The green uh, lines are in fact the, 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 the microtubuli. Um, and they are working. Remember, these are just empty uh, tubes filled with water. When they start dividing a, a cell, they are working perfectly uh, in synchronicity. And they're starting cutting the, the cell. Another example, this is happening in each of our bodies now uh, 200 billion times, yeah? Um, average length 15 uh, micrometer. Ha yesterday we heard that the diameter was uh, 12, uh, 40 nanometers. I'm not the person to argue about that. If we want to cure cancer, we have to take water into uh, the equation and probably structured water because cancer yeah, is uncontrolled cell division. What you see now is that the latest anti-cancer research starts to focus on the role of uh, microtubules. So that's my last slide, where there is smoke, there is fire. This water only has the capacity to remember information, or can it also compute or process information? And I plan to do a next project uh, that's going to try to investigate that. I'm not going because I don't have time here, but if you're interested in helping me, feel free to contact me. There you have my email address. And again, thanks to Alex, because it's because of him I'm here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry Follett, for these incredible perspectives. I think there are questions. Not too many, because we have to go on. Yeah. Hello, Jerry. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. I just wanted to add um, that on my radio show two years ago, I had a man named Matthias Di, Di, Matthias Di Stefano, who um, has memories of living in Atlantis 15,000 years ago. And they used water-based organic computers on the quantum level. That's why you don't find anything, because 
when Atlantis imploded, all of their computers were made of water and it went into the Atlantic. And he said, one day you'll be able to read the history books of Atlantis by analyzing the water of the Atlantic. And so you're on the right track to find a water-based computer, <laughs> which you. is thousands of years ahead of us, by the way, but we will do it eventually. Yeah. Thank you. It's great stuff. Yes. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, very inspiring. Just a comment. Um, when you continue your study, what is really a quantum computer? And, and you can prove it. If you use a lambda, a light in the near infrared range, and you can beautifully see this with, with the spectrum of, of water at all these uh, systems. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, I think it's one of the uh, potential ways we have to go because it's not only about reading, but also about seeing. At the end, I want to do t say one plus one, give me the result, and I think that's going to be possible, and much more than that. But we have to start very simple. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. I would like to uh, make a comment, um, a short one. Uh, water can do even more than just computation. I say just computation because uh, um, uh, you see the point is uh, to go from information to meaning. So uh, life does what is meaning meaningful for uh, the alive subject, let's say. So maybe in the water you could get also a um, transition from a syn syntax to semantics. But this is a comment which I leave uh, flying. Uh. Yeah, I don't want to go. Uh, I, I fully agree, and I think it's the basis of consciousness. But I don't want to touch that, because then you very quickly come in other domains, and people don't take you seriously anymore. That's why I try to keep it very scientific. OK. Um, thank you for your nice presentation. And uh, I think that you are on the right track because uh, I, um, as solid state quantum computer are, are uh, just uh, realizing that, uh, you know, if you want to increase linearly the qubits that you're dealing with, I mean, the complexity of the systems goes exponential. And so <laughs> I'd really uh, w like to see a, 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 cube, a, a, com a quantum computer with 50 qubits, you know, you know? Well, I don't know we, uh, when. Yeah. And so I think that uh, the, the future will be just on, on something more <laughs> flexible, like uh, something that we know quite well, <laughs> or we try to know quite better than others. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just one more question, then it will be the next presentation. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so back to the water. Uh, can you explain in more detail the relationship between the parameters that you measured and the imprinting of water? Could we maybe address that separately uh, afterwards? I, I, I can do it. I can show you the results better than it's easier to, to, to understand. What we did, in fact, we had uh, machines like to measure uh, sound velocity, and then we measured the sound velocity just of, uh, of water. And then we started to uh, diluting, and then we saw what the uh, sound velocity was after one time diluting, three times diluting, five times diluting, and that's how we did it for the different parameters we were uh, we were measuring. That's a bit, that's a bit how we did it. But feel free to come afterwards. I can show you some details. All right. Thank you very much once again, and we can applaud once again. Yeah. Thank you.